Hi, everyone. How's it going? Everyone excited? Last session on Friday. Uh, my name is Danny Turkovich. I'm one of the product managers here at FBN. Uh, I've talked to a lot of you out at the uh, Designing FBN booth, uh, get a lot of good feedback. Thanks for everyone that stopped by. Um, your feedback is incredibly helpful uh, for everything we do at FBN. Uh, this company is, is very young. We're only three years old. And uh, when we started, you know, we started with an idea of, hey, a network of farmers and all of their data, uh, what can we do with that? How can we transform the industry? And how can we use that information to empower farmers? And the only way we're able to do what we've done, and we've done a lot in the last three years, is with feedback from, from farmers. And uh, so keep it coming. Um, we'll still be here after, after the session. So if there's any last, last feedback, bring it on. And even when you go back to the farms, email us, call us. Um, we'd love to hear uh, your thoughts. Uh, we're going to go through some of the new products that have come out in the last year as well as some things that um, are under development, a uh, sneak peek of what might be coming out in 2018, and just talk a little bit about how people are, are using FBN and getting value out of it. Um, so how many people here have actually purchased their seeds so far um, for the next season? All right, handful. Uh, another question, how many people have either not purchased seeds or might be making a substitution? All right, so... Basically, I mean, right now we're in the midst of seed purchasing or just finishing early purchases. Uh, seed analytics is one of the uh, big parts of FBN. We have, probably, we have the most elite seed system in, in, the, in the country, in the world. Um, the reason that that is is because we are completely independent and unbiased. We do not push a single brand, uh, single type, types of varieties or anything like that. We just want to show all of the data on every single brand that's out there. And we have the deepest... Uh, data network uh, in, the, in the world. 17 million acres powering our seed system. Uh, what's new this year is we've added genetic traits. This came out about uh, a month ago. So we know genetic traits is one of the primary things that is important to you when you're se selecting seeds for corn, soybeans, and things like that. So now when you go into Seed Finder, there's a new filter where you can select the types of tolerances you want. So you can select just for conventional varieties if you want to just see conventional varieties. Or you can look at uh, glyphosate tolerance for Roundup, uh, glufosinate tolerance for Liberty, uh, corn borer, rootworm, or even drought tolerance. Um, when you're in Seed Finder, and some of you are new to FBN, so you might not have spent too much time in Seed Finder, uh, there's, a, there's a handful of filters at the top. You can be filtering by location. You can be filtering by traits, relative maturity. Um, you can look at data just for irrigated acres or non-irrigated acres. You can look at data from fields with drainage, without drainage. You can filter by crop rotation. Uh, soil type, soil texture. There's lots of different ways to cut the data in Seed Finder to make it extremely valuable. Um, so let's just take a look at doing a search in Seed Finder with this uh, trait filter. So here's two varieties that come up in that search result. You've got a decal number with uh, Smart Stacks and a Pioneer number with AcreMax Extra. So both of these varieties are going to have glyphosate tolerance, glufosinate tolerance, corn borer, and rootworm control. So take a look at the yields. The decal number is uh, three and a half bushels more in yield. But take a look at the average price. It's around $50 a bag more expensive for the smart stacks trait in the decal number than it is for the other one. So this is the kind of information that you can get in Seed Finder. Extremely powerful to be making those decisions in terms of what is going to give you the highest ROI. In order to get access to this information in Seed Finder, you have to contribute agronomic data, yield and planting data, if you have not already contributed data. You also have to contribute uh, seed invoices to unlock the price transparency aspect of it. Um, another thing that is useful when you're in, in a Seed Finder is all of these columns on the very top help you sort and filter all of the data underneath. So if you want to find you know, what, is the, you know, what varieties have the most acres in FBN, you just click that label, acres in FBN, and it's going to filter all of the search results from highest to lowest acres. You can do that on relative maturity, typical yield range, the pricing, or the price range. All that information is right at your fingertips. Seed Finder basically unlocks all of the data from all the farmers in FBN aggregated together to expose all the seed information. The way we, we kind of think about it is it's making the world your plot trial. Instead of looking at a plot trial from a university or from a seed company that might be one acre or two acres or something like that, you're looking at data from thousands and thousands of acres. Our most popular varieties in FBN 
we have over 300,000 acres of data on a single variety. That's a lot of information to help uh, make, a, make a decision. A lot of farmers look for uh, lots of acres to, to help give them confidence. Other farmers are happy to just see varieties that have maybe 250, 300, 400 acres, particularly if they're looking at experimenting with new varieties. Um, obviously, the more acreage you get, there's more confidence behind that. But even when there's only a handful of acres, it's still pretty, pretty valuable for making decisions, particularly on some of the new things that you might want to experiment. Everything in FBN, we have what we call data sufficiency rules. So we won't show data in Seed Finder until we've gotten a minimum number of records from a minimum number of farmers and acres. And that's so that we can be sure that the data that we're showing is, is valid, as well as to protect the anonymity of our, of our member base. So we just added uh, genetic traits into Seed Finder. We're also doing a bunch of data science work on evaluating the effectiveness and the ROI of, of, of different traits. So one of the first things that we've looked at is looking at uh, the first generation glyphosate tolerance traits against the next generation Roundup Ready uh, trait. So a lot of companies do this. They'll put in a lot of uh, research and development into their next generation of, of products, and they bring that to market, and it's supposed to be doing so much better, bringing higher yields and all of this. And obviously, they end up uh, marketing it at a higher price. So we have all this data from our members. We've analyzed it. Here on the left-hand side, you can see this is the cost or the seed price um, per acre for glyphosate tolerance versus uh, the Roundup Ready traits. Roundup Ready traits are uh, much higher, three dollars um, per acre higher. And then you take a look at the yield. The yield is almost uh, no difference. So throughout the network, analyzing all this data, real-world yield data, real-world pricing information, really there's not a higher ROI for these next this, this next generation trait. Now, that's not to say that this is gonna be ubiquitous across everything, but this just shows the value of having all this information so that you can use it to make informed decisions on whether it's worth it to be paying when you know a lot of marketing materials come out for the next generation products. So another uh, thing you can do in Seed Finder is compare uh, conventional varieties versus varieties with uh, traits. So this was a search I'd ran in Illinois looking at seeds that are between 110 and 115 days. So what you'll notice is, and if you can't see it, it's basically alternating from the very top. There's a Wiffles number that's conventional, and then a decal number that's smart stacks. And it's really just conventional, smart stacks, conventional, smart, smart stacks. And this is sorted by yield. The yield numbers are going from 237 to uh, 232. So all of these varieties in Illinois in the very similar relative maturity range are yielding pretty similar uh, results. But what do you think is gonna be more expensive? Conventional, no? Yeah, smart stacks is gonna be much more expensive. Um, so some of your fields, you might need to have the control of the traits uh, because you've had press pressures there in the past, and that's, that's fine if you do, then maybe it's worth it to do it. But you should also be looking at what, are, what, what else is out there that might not be as expensive. The more traits, the more expensive the seed's gonna be. If there's conventional options out there that are performing well and you don't have the pest pressures or the weed pressures, those might be good options to uh, bring down your, your overall uh, cost of production in terms of uh, seed cost. So Seed Finder is a really powerful tool and just to exhibit how powerful it is, what we've done is kind of a back test through the entire FBN uh, data set. This is one of the great things about having such a big data set and uh, the power of big data is you can basically go back and run experiments on all the data that's in the network. So what we did is looked at data from what people planted at the beginning of the year. And we broke this into two groups. We looked at farmers that planted the variety that basically performed the best in Seed Finder for their, for their operation, their fields. Um, now, those farmers might have used Seed Finder or they might have you know, randomly picked the best seed or they might have a seed company that's supplying the best seed. But regardless, at the beginning of that year, their decision to plant a seed on a field matched up with what Seed Finder said. Now we compared that to a group of farmers that didn't do that and planted varieties that didn't show up as the top varieties in Seed Finder. Over the entire network when we did this analysis, farmers that planted the top performing varieties in Seed Finder performed on average six bushels an acre better in terms of yield. And in areas where we had lots of data, lots of farmers contributing, and we had lots of data on the soil types for that farm, the difference was 17 bushels. 
And this is looking at all historical data. So it's really important when you're using Seed Finder to utilize the past year's data. Uh, just looking at 2017 is gonna throw out very valuable data from the past years, and it might just be an anomaly from a weather standpoint. So you use the past year's data. Using Seed Finder is gonna give you much more informed decisions about what might be working well for, for your uh, soil types. Um, so that is, that is one example of the power of using Seed Finder and the power of using uh, big data. I wanna bring up uh, Matt Meisner, who's our head of data science. Uh, he's got a, an example to really clarify uh, the value of using this information and why it is so uh, beneficial. Thanks, Danny. So anything, anytime you're looking at data, uh, whether it's from your own monitor, whether it's from university trial data, from a C company trial, or from the FBN data, what's really critical is to ask yourself, why should we trust it, right? It's very easy to put out data. Uh, it's very easy to have data on a website. It's very easy to say data is valuable but how do we actually know that's the case? And the real key reason why data matters so much and why particularly the FBN data is really, really valuable is because we've aggregated a lot of it from a lot of different farmers together, which makes it infinitely more valuable than data would ever be if you're only looking at data from your own farm or, or, or only looking at data from your area um, or only looking at trial data. And one of the key reasons that this is the case is that all data has errors in it. Every single data point that's collected is wrong, right? Every single monitor is probably recording yield that's a little bit too high, a little bit too low. And we hear a lot of times from our farmers a very valid question as to why should I trust the network data when there's all this bad data going into the system? So the key reason why that's the case is that when you have a lot of data, there are errors, right? There are some monitors that'll record yields that are too high. There's other monitors that'll record yields that are too low. But in aggregate, those cancel out. And there's a famous example of why, of how this, uh, this, how this happens and why this actually plays out and gives accurate data in the long run, even if there is a lot of bad data going into the system. And for those of you who are in the data science talk yesterday afternoon, you've already heard this example, but bear with me. I know a lot of people couldn't make it to that, so we wanted to wanted to share it again. So the experiment that happened with this a long time ago was about 100 years ago, uh, a, frame, a famous statistician in England ran an experiment where at a state fair, they brought an ox, a huge ox that nobody, nobody knew how much it weighed. And there was a contest at this fair where people could enter their name in a, in a guess for the weight of this ox. And then at the end of the fair, whoever had the most accurate guess would get some kind of a prize. And you know, the, the key thing here is that all the people putting in guesses for the weight of this ox were not experts, okay? They were not you know, expert local, you know, expert uh, people who know a lot about oxes, right? They were just regular people at a fair. And what happened is that the average guess, and there were about 800 guesses that were submitted in this context, was actually within one pound of the correct weight of this ox. The ox weighed, I think, 1,198 pounds and the median guess was something like 1,207, and the average, the mean, was 1,197. So it was within one pound. So we had a little bit of fun in the data science talk yesterday, and we wanted to try to recreate this experiment. And we didn't know how well it would work, um, and what we did is we asked people to guess my weight. Um, so we put up a text poll, we had people text in their guesses to see how much I weighed. A, a room full of people who don't know me, right? 99% of the people in the room had probably never met me before. Uh, we had about 200 people submit guesses. And here's what we found. So we got about 200 guesses, and the median guess was 167 and a half pounds. And my actual weight is 167. And again, this is from 200 people who don't know me, right? These are not experts. These are, these are people, all of you, many of you who voted, um, who you know, don't, don't know me at all. And the point here is that Crowds are really smart. Crowds are actually smarter often than the smartest person in the crowd. And when you aggregate data together from a lot of people, the data becomes more valuable because there was, as you can see, there were a lot of people that put in guesses that were too low. There were a lot of people that put in guesses that were too high. But in aggregate, they got the right answer anyway. Even though every individual guess was wrong or not exactly correct, in aggregate, the result was almost perfect. And we want to show one example here, and we'll show how the distribution of guesses came in over time uh, to show you how this, uh, 
how this stabilized over time. So what we're looking at here is a running median uh, of the average guess over time as we collected more and more data. So the first guess, I'll admit that I put in, I guess 500 pounds, and that was to prove a point. I didn't actually think that was right, but I wasn't off on my units or anything, but I put in 500 pounds to make the point that if you stopped with a small amount of data, if you were to stop when you were at one guess, you could have incorrectly concluded that my weight was 500 pounds, because that was the only data point you have, right? So in a small data set, having one or two bad data points is really, really, really a big problem. If you're looking at trial data, if you're looking at data from your own farm, and there's a miscalibrated monitor, that's really, really bad. But if you're looking at data from thousands of farms from across the country in aggregate, they cancel out. Every, all of the data going into it might be, might be a little bit miscalibrated, but it doesn't matter. In aggregate, it's right. So, you know, the point here is really that crowds are smart. All of you are very, very smart together. Uh, FBN's main goal with the agronomic analytics is to help bring that intelligence uh, to life by aggregating data from all of you, putting it in one place so that, um, so that we can actually see what the truth is. You can see the average there is the, is the dashed line and people, people got really close. So as a, just as curiosity last night, I was talking to my wife who you would think would be an expert in my weight, you would hope. Um, and I asked her what she thought I weighed after I told her about this experiment. And she guessed 150. So, you know, this is another example of where the expert was not correct. All of you are smarter, um, smarter than, than the expert, and uh, in aggregate got a much better result. So, in any case, um, the yield data, like Danny was showing in SeedFinder, is really, really valuable. It helps you pick the better seeds, it helps uh, give confidence in the data. And really the underlying principle that drives that is the fact that all of the data contributed together cancels out all the errors and gets a really, really, really accurate number um, when all of it is, is aggregated and shared together. So I will uh, turn it back over to Danny to talk a little bit more about some of our other products, but just wanted to um, give all of you some of, the, some of the background and why we see some of the big benefits in, in, uh, in farmers who are using the aggregated data to select seeds. Thanks. Thanks, Matt. Yeah, pretty interesting uh, experiment, uh, both on the ox and, and Matt's weight. So that's what's uh, important when you're looking at seed finder, you'll see the average yield of these varieties. And so one of the most important things is looking at the relative weighting between the two varieties or the difference between the yields. Which one is higher yielding? Which one is consistently higher yielding? Which one is consistently lower yielding? Because that's really what that average yield is, is showing you. Now, individual observations from one or the other might be a little bit inverted, but if you are a betting person, you know, you're, you, be, you, you want to be putting your money on the one that has a higher, higher average yield because, you know, nine times out of ten, that variety is probably going to perform higher than the one that has a lower average yield. So other new things that um, we've come out with this year, uh, seed price transparency. This came out earlier this spring. Uh, you saw it a little bit in Seed Finder, but when you drill in to Seed Finder, every, every uh, variety in Seed Finder is highlighted in blue. Uh, that means you can click into it and it brings you into a product profile for that variety. And there's a ton of information in that product profile, uh, including the seed tr price transparency, but also including things like uh, uh, the uh, impact of seeding rate on yield for that variety. You can look at how that variety performs at different seeding rate buckets. You can look at how that variety performs by different rates of nitrogen application, by different planting dates. Many farmers use that for uh, during their planting to figure out their whole planting rotation, which varieties are going to perform poorly when planted too early or too late. All that information is in there when you drill into those seeds. But you'll also find this, seed price transparency. So this is a variety, uh, a decal number that has smart stack straight. Uh, this is information filtered for the state of Illinois. So you can filter down this data to a specific state. Look at the difference in prices in the state of Illinois. So this is not being made up by different traits. So DeKalb only sells their varieties with a single trait package. So there's no impact of traits in here. This is all location within Illinois, as well as a lot of discounts, a lot of you know, negotiation, uh, a lot of you know, back dealings and everything like that. What it shows you is the amount of margins that the seed company has to play with in order to make a sale. Now when we get this data, we get this data from invoices sent from farmers and we basically translate all that information from the invoice into our, our system. 
we're not allowing people just to enter in a, a random price that they you know might want to put in there that might uh, dilute the, the the data in the system. The price that we're entering is the net price paid by the farmer. So that includes volume discounts, that includes early paid discounts, and everything like that. That is all included in the range of prices. So when you look at this this graph, prices on the left hand side, the low end, those are farmers that probably paid early. They're large farms. They got a big volume discount. Um, maybe they have some negotiation power. Maybe uh, maybe the decal dealer took them away from a pioneer dealer and offered a big discount in order to do that. But that's basically how low you can go. On the upper end, that's if you're you know paying full price. That's where you are. Now the way farmers are using this is basically for negotiation, because now you have way more data points when you are making a seed purchasing decision or when you're negotiating to say, okay, if I'm getting quoted. Uh, $360 or something for his bag of seed. Why is that? And you can have a conversation with your dealer to say, hey, I've got this information saying that I'm on the right end of this graph. And you better have a good reason of why I'm on this right end of this graph. And what do I need to do to get to the left end of this graph to pay, pay, uh, uh, pay a little bit less? Um, it's also useful to compare the price, uh, price, price distributions between different varieties so you can say, okay, well, might, is there any more pricing power that I can get by switching to a different brand or a different variety? So all of this is uh, in Seed Finder when you drill into a specific seed. Uh, we talked about this um, a little bit before in other presentations, but this was a, a big thing that we came out with this year, this year the seed relabeling. So this, was, this is amazing because if you think about where we were a year ago in terms of this knowledge and where we are today, um, a year ago, no one really knew what the, essentially the genetic makeup of the seed industry was. Even the seed companies, you know, only a few seed companies knew who they, who they licensed their genetics to. But no one really had a complete map of the seed industry. As Amal talked about in one of the first presentations, that is the, seed, the entire ag industry has so much more power, in, uh, information power over farmers and one of the things that we want to do at FBN is try to break that down, to democratize information, and that's what really you guys bring to the table is unlocking this. And this is essentially what you guys did this year, is by providing this information, taking pictures of seed tags and emailing them in, we were able to create an entire map of the seed industry. We know who licenses what genetics from whom. And now growers can use this when they're making purchasing decisions to find out what varieties are basically the same exact variety and what, what uh, brand names and labels are they sold under. So when you're in Seed Finder, you'll see there's an also sold as button right next to a, a variety. If that also sold as button shows up, then that means that variety is basically sold by other brands, that same exact variety, those same genetics. When you click on that, you'll, it'll pop up a list and it'll show which varieties are also sold as um, or basically the same genetics as, in this case, it's that Dynagro number. So with this information, you can go back to your seed dealer. If uh, they're quoting you a high price, there might be lower price things that you're finding in FBN, or you could even go call up the other brand names and find out what they're selling because we're doing the, we've been running the analytics on this, and, I mean, just to confirm that these are the same numbers, I mean, the yields are exactly the same. There's no difference in these seeds. The only difference is in the price. Maybe there's some service difference between the dealers and everything like that, but the seed genetics are exactly the same. So this is information that the industry did def definitely did not want to let out of the bag, but now it's out there. And this is all about empowering farmers with the information that you're contributing. So thank you everyone that contributed. In order to unlock this, you, had to, you have to have added uh, seed tags or send in seed tags to us. Uh, you can also get access to it by sending in your seed invoices. Uh, we'll be doing this again next year. We'll be sending out lots of uh, information to try to send in more seed tags. We want to continue building this database and uh, continue making it uh, really strong. Uh, this is something that's under development right now. It's not in the website yet, but something that's uh, pretty exciting. I'm really excited about it. So think about relative maturity. Everyone uses relative maturity when making a seed purchasing decision, right? Uh, and Relative maturity is a number that is, you know, generated by a, a seed company. There's no standardization whatsoever. There's no kind of official standards of how you come up with relative maturity. Um, some brands might think of relative maturity a little bit differently than others. And 
if you plant a 97-day variety in North Dakota and plant that in South Dakota and plant that in Nebraska, the actual maturity on that variety is going to be much different because it doesn't matter that it's a 97-day variety. It matters where you plant it. It matters about the environment of the farm, the climate of the farm. That's really what is driving the maturity of that variety. So at FBN, we're trying to come up with a much more data-driven way that takes into account all of the local factors, the environmental factors, to really come up with a much more true uh, quantification and a true way to think about what is the season length of this variety and what's going to work best for my farm, what's going to be optimal for my farm. So as an example to look at this, we looked at some data from the 10 counties right around Omaha. And farmers in this, uh, in this region typically planted within a nine-day relative maturity window from 108 to 116. So it's a pretty narrow range. But what's going on is that there are lots of varieties that are below that range and lots of varieties that are above that range that have the same exact season length when planted in Omaha. And a lot of varieties that are outside of that range are still top performers. So here's a handful of the top performers. And you can see that over half of them are not within that relative maturity range. So the farmers in this region had their window, their nine-day window, and just by setting that window as the first way to look at what seeds they're going to consider, they're throwing out almost half of the varieties that might be, might be working well on their farm. When you do that, you limit your options. When you limit your options, you limit finding varieties that are going to perform, have a high, uh, a high yield or a good ROI because they're, they're low cost. So this is under development. This is going to show up in 2018. We're basically going to have a personalized season length metric for each variety for your farm. So you can be looking at, in Seed Finder, you can be looking at, okay, I want to find varieties that perform well for my farm. What season length do I need to get to get to a harvestable moisture? In this case, in Omaha, farmers typically were harvesting around 17%. And you can look at all the varieties that fall within that season length that is optimal for your farm, regardless of what the labeled relative maturity is from the seed companies. Yield potential is a system that, um, if you're new, you probably haven't seen it. Uh, this is an incredibly powerful system for choosing seeds specific to your fields. So what yield potential does is it takes, looks at all of the soil types in your field. And this is kind of trying to answer the question of what is the best variety to plant on this field, given that there's lots of different soil types. We know that varieties perform differently when planted on different soil types. And so if you could only choose one variety and plant them on lots of different soil types for that field, which is the best one? And this is something that takes into account a lot of different factors. There's a lot of data science that goes behind uh, making yield potential a really useful tool. So with this large data set, we're seeing lots of farmers that are planting on all these different soil types. So even if you've never planted a variety on this soil type, you can still get access to the data because other farmers have done that. And we're, we're getting farm, uh, data from lots of different years, but with a large data set, you can statistically control for all that. So you know that, well, some of the data came in from 2016, which had certain weather characteristics. 2015 had different weather characteristics. Some farmers had irrigated land. Some farmers did not have irrigated land. All those factors in a large data set you can control for. And what you can do is start isolating what is the actual impact of that specific variety on these soil types. And what we're trying to do is essentially put all of these varieties on a level playing field and estimate, okay, if next year is going to be a good year and you were to plant this variety on this soil type, what kind of yields can you expect? And what is the relative difference between yields of these varieties? Um, so this is a great tool for selecting seeds for your farm and specifically for certain fields to place seeds onto your fields. Um, I was talking to one farmer on Wednesday who said he sent back seeds last year because he found better seeds in yield potential and they've been performing better than he has ever performed on that field. Um, so using data definitely works, um, works uh, on your farm. Uh, we're doing a lot of work right now in making this entire system much better. Um, rather than using soil types, which is uh, what we use a lot in our system, and, and many of you probably a lot use soil type a lot in your analysis of your farm, we're doing a whole new classification of soils because soil types really are just a label. Soil type is a label for a lot of other information about the soil, such as the soil texture, the available water holding capacity, uh, things like that. 
And what we're doing with this oil classification system is it's going to enable us to uh, really just leverage more and more data from the system. Because even though we've never observed a specific variety on a specific soil type, we've observed it on other soil types that are very much related. So it's gonna give us much better power to uh, interpret how a variety might perform when planted on your fields and on your soil types. Um, so moving on uh, from the seed system. So uh, seed finder and yield potential are the, uh, the you know, core parts of the FPN uh, seed system. Analyze My Operation is a section where it organizes all of your data, um, has all of your maps. Uh, it's where you can benchmark yourself against, uh, against other farmers in your area. Here are some of the things that have come out in, uh, in the Analyze My Operation section. First, when you first get in there, you'll notice something new, but we have a, a whole new way to visualize um, the activities from your farm. Uh, this is the timeline. The timeline pulls in all of the data from uh, your monitors that you've been entering, uh, that you've been sending in, pulls in all the data from uh, events that you might have created into the website, as well as the mobile app. So now the mobile app and the website talk together, uh, talk to each other, send data to the phone from the website, and vice versa from the phone uh, back to the website. So you have all your information in one place. You can look across the entire operation to find out what are the most recent activities across my entire farm. Um, if you have uh, uh, other people in your farm that are using the FBN Ops app um, and they're doing activities, you can be at home on your monitor finding out what activities they're recording. Um, localized benchmarking is another big improvement this year. So uh, right now, when you go into Analyze My Operation, you can evaluate your performance against all of FBN, against other farmers uh, in your state, in your county. Um, this year, uh, we, we launched localized benchmarking to look at farmers within 50 miles of you, as well as 100 miles of you. These options will show up when we have enough data in your region. Um, so if you're in an area that is uh, very dense with FBN members that are contributing lots of data, you'll be able to drill down to 50 miles. There'll also be, there's also a question mark up there. If you tap on that question mark, it'll actually show you, um, uh, give you an idea of how many acres and how many fields this data is based off of. Uh, terrain maps was a big, uh, big new release earlier this year. So we went through all of the elevation data in the United States, and basically for all of our fields um, uh, in the system, we went through and determined what are the different slope aspects of that field. So where are the high points, the hilltops, uh, the flat areas, and the gullies? And this is available as a map in your accounts, so you can pull it up to just see what does it look like. You probably already know because you're driving over the fields all the time. Um, but it's also there as a layer so you can compare it to your yield maps. So uh, in mapping the mapping section, there's a little button to say compare maps. That gives you the ability to drop another map on there, like a yield map and a little swiping feature. So you can swipe back and forth and say, okay, well, in these areas where I've got my goalies, what's going on with yield there this year? And that's a good way to visually compare the information and see what's going on. There's also a way to uh, look at this in a quantitative, fact, uh, quantitative way. In the natural features section of Analyze My Operation, you'll be able to see all of the yield analyzed on your farm by these different terrain factors. So how did yield perform in the goalies on my operation for corn, let's say, versus the hilltops, versus the flat areas? In Analyze My Operation, it's set up where we have the fields on the left-hand side as well as the name of your operation and the name of all your farms. Um, when you when one of those is highlighted, let's say the name of your entire enterprise is highlighted, what that does is aggregates all the data across all of your fields. So what you can do is say, across my entire operation, what is the impact of terrain on yield? Okay, now there's a specific field you wanna look at. You just click on that field and you'll see the same exact graph, but it'll only be looking at that data from that field. So it gives you a lot of power to be able to understand how these trends might be impacting the entire operation, but also on the field by field level, allows you to investigate deeper to find out what might be going on on that specific field. Um, something that we're really excited about uh, in 2018, we're gonna be doing a lot of work, there's gonna be a lot of stuff coming out around uh, application analytics and application reports. Um, we're working on unlocking this data and utilizing this data, we've got a lot of it already entered in. Um, but be on the lookout for uh, information on this over the next few months. We're probably gonna be asking a lot of you to come into your accounts and um, uh, backfill some data with some additional information around tank mixes. That's gonna basically unlock a lot of these types of features. Th some of the things that we're looking at 
our uh, benchmarking on fertilizer and chemical usage rates. So you can look at, okay, I'm looking at applying this certain chemical. What other rates are people using? What should I be using? What other products are people using in their tank mix when they apply this chemical? All very useful information to be thinking about um, when you're going to be making spraying decisions or fertilizer decisions. Pulling down your spray records. When you put in your application data into FBN, we can pull those spray records along with the weather information automatically um, from, from our weather system so that if you have to get audited or something, you need to pull, reference that information. It's on hand. Uh, as well as lots of information on uh, fertility analytics. So lots of questions around, you know, what are the best... Um, you know, rates of, of nitrogen application. How about timing of nitrogen application? How does that impact yield? Uh, we got a lot of really good suggestions over at the design feedback booth around fungicides. So are fungicides worth it? Um, should I be applying fungicides on my corn? Uh, in what conditions are fungicides worth it? What kind of weather should I be looking for in order to justify the cost of applying a fungicide? A lot of folks are applying a fungicide almost as an insurance policy just in case it, uh, the weather goes a certain way. But with more knowledge about how yield's actually gonna be impacted by those fungicide sprays, you can hold off on making that, that investment and that cost until it actually gets to the situation where you need to make it. Another way to uh, save a little bit of money throughout the year and control some costs. Um, so now I'm gonna uh, turn things over to uh, Jordan Taylor. Uh, Jordan is product manager here at FBN, uh, started about a year ago, and he's been leading the effort on uh, building out our online store. Thanks, Danny. Um, so I'm really excited to show you guys some of the new features that are part of the new FBN Direct online store. I uh, want to first just share a little bit about how I came to FBN. Uh, my first week was actually right before Farmer to Farmer last year. Um, so I'm originally from Missoula, Montana, and didn't grow up on a farm, but I spent a bunch of summers on my grandfather's farm in west central Illinois. And about a year and a half ago, when I was working in a product development role at a different company, I uh, decided to go down and help my cousin, my uncle, out with harvest, and hadn't been down there for about half a decade, so it was actually the first time that I had seen a precision monitor in person. Um, so I'm watching all this data get logged on the monitor, um, and as somebody that works with data every day in my, my day job, um, it was really fascinating to me uh, to think about all the different opportunities that farmers could have to use this data. Uh, and so in grilling, you know, my cousin and my uncle about what they were going to do, they mentioned that they had just signed up uh, for this new service called FBN. Um, so I did some research, was really fascinated with the company, uh, reached out and started talking to the team. And I immediately knew after those discussions that this was a mission that I needed to be a part of, uh, that everybody here was genuinely fully committed uh, to helping out farmers and enabling them to be more successful. Um, so over my first year, this is one of the, the major projects that I've focused on. And I uh, want to first start by kind of showing you the, uh, the main product comparison in the store that uh, you'll see whenever you search a chemical product. So here you're seeing the page for Roundup Power Max. And on the left-hand side, you'll notice that there's all of the critical pieces of information that you need uh, to evaluate that product. So this includes mode of action, the label, active ingredients, concentration, uh, what sizes we offer it in. Uh, but you'll also notice on the right-hand side uh, that we will show any alternative with that same active ingredient that we show. Um, and so we talked to dozens of members, both FBN Direct customers and people that haven't purchased through FBN Direct, to understand what is difficult and annoying about trying to buy chemicals. And one of the things that repeatedly came up time and time again is that when you're trying to evaluate products that have the same active but have a different concentration, it's annoying and difficult to have to do the computations to figure out what is the price on an apples to apples basis. So what we're doing here is, on the right hand side, you'll see that we have a glyphosate value pick, uh, which for us is providing the best price um, in exchange for procuring a, a glyphosate alternative. Um, and it is at a lower concentration than Roundup, so it's three pounds per gallon acid equivalent compared to 4.5 pounds per gallon on the Roundup side. So we multiply our list price by 1.5 to show you on an apple apples basis what is the price that you're going to pay. So another feature that we've heard from farmers in the last five weeks has been really helpful uh, is the mode of action. 
um, and showing products that have the same mode of action that don't have the same active ingredients. So just by a show of hands here, how many of, uh, how many of you consider mode of action when you're evaluating chemical products? Okay, decent show of hands. Um, so that's what we saw talking to farmers. You know, not everybody does this, um, but it's increasingly becoming more and more important uh, as pests and diseases, um, you know, become more prevalent and uh, develop resistance to some of the most common active ingredients. And so what we're doing here is we're showing you the entire glossary of products that might be related for what you initially came in looking for. Uh, so in one column, you have the same active at the same concentration. Different column, you have same active at a different concentration. And then finally, you have the same mode of action with a different active ingredient. And so farmers have found this really effective in you know, finding out about products that they otherwise maybe weren't aware of um, that might be better suited to address whatever problem that they're buying a chemical for. So this is an active ingredient page, and you'll notice in the top right-hand side of the screen uh, that there's a search box there, and you can search for any chemical product or active ingredient. And in this case, I search for glyphosate, and this will pull up, or I search for clethodome, I'm sorry, um, and this will pull up a page that shows every product that has just clethodome as an active ingredient, and also every product that has clethodome in addition to other active ingredients. And so this is a really great resource is if you know that you need an AI to act on something and you want to know what is the entire universe of products out there. And additionally, what does FBN carry that if I'm interested in buying from FBN, I can easily click that product and drill into the product page. Another thing that I wanted to point out is what we call the favorites list. Um, so common piece of feedback that we got from farmers that had been on the direct platform was that you know, they have common sets of chemicals that they use year over year. And it's really important for them that they're able to immediately go in and assess how do they stack up against the market and does FBN have a product uh, that might be useful for them. And so you'll see here, this is from a farmer that submitted invoices. And so this unlocked the market average. So if you submit an invoice from the current crop year with at least three prices, you'll be able to see the market average for any product uh, that we have data sufficiency for. You'll also see the price that you paid and immediately be able to look at what the difference is between what you paid and the market average. And so in the case of Atrazine 4, you can see that you, know, you paid $14 a gallon. Um, unfortunately, that's a little bit above the market average. Uh, but fortunately in this case, FBN actually has an alternative uh, that is atrazine four, that's 27% cheaper than what you paid. Um, you know, we won't always be 27% cheaper, uh, it varies, but our goal with this um, is to be as transparent as possible and give you as much information uh, as humanly possible so that you can evaluate and make an objective decision that's gonna be best for your farm. Another thing I wanted to point out is the adjuvant browsing experience that we have. Um, this is a little bit different than when you're looking for a herbicide or a fungicide or an insecticide. Um, and when I first started looking into adjuvants earlier this year, uh, it was very clear to me that this is somewhat of a black box um, to a lot of members in our network. And understandably so, because there's really a lack of, uh, of resources, both online um, or anywhere I could find, uh, that really give you a comprehensive categorization of all the different adjuvants out there. And so what we did is we partnered with uh, a bunch of agronomists as well as academics um, at some leading universities, and we tried to take a stab at categorizing you know, the 600 or so adjuvants that are in our website. And so what you see here is a farmer has come in, um, and they're looking to shop, so they check the in-stock button. They also look at defomer and surfactant, because they know that they need a surfactant that's also going to be a defomer, and it immediately narrows it down from 600 adjuvants to the three that we sell. Now, even if you're not looking to buy from us, this is a really useful tool. Uh, if you're just researching products, want to know what's out there, want to see pricing distribution uh, for a particular adjuvant, you could uncheck the in stock and then click any of the other checkboxes and you'll see a list of adjuvants that have those categories. So that's, that's all for now, but I, uh, I want to say that whenever you know, we develop products at FBN, uh, it's really critical for us uh, that we talk to as many farmers as possible before we commit to an idea. Um, one of our common practices is, even when we're pretty confident about a feature, we'll build a prototype. Um, some of you I may have spoken with earlier this year, 
and we'll actually run it through you, run it through with you on a screen share. Um, and so whether you've been in the store already or you are going to check it out after this conference, uh, please email me with any feedback. Um, always, always happy to talk to you. Um, and this type of feedback is really instrumental in helping us decide what we're going to build next. Um, so with that, I'll go back to Danny. Thanks, Jordan. All right. Uh, so how many here, how many people here have uh, logged into Profit Center and seen it? All right, good number. How many people here have sold grain in the last six months? All right. Well, uh, if you're going to be selling grain, uh, Profit Center is definitely an essential tool, should be an essential tool for you. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about what it is, why we built it. So as a farmer, if you're marketing grain, there is a ton of information that you have to deal with. This is just a small example. There's a lot more. So this is six bids um, that might come on any given day. Each of them might have a different cash price, a different basis, uh, a different distance from your farm, thus a different transportation cost, uh, a different delivery window. So some of them might be for delivering your grain right now. Some of them might be for delivering your grain in the future, uh, January, March, April of next year. So that brings up a question around storage cost. So on a daily basis, if you're getting this information, how are you going to make the best decision with all of these costs that you have to factor in? Well, you could plug all of these into an Excel spreadsheet. I mean, I've done that before to find out what is the actual net price of all of these. How do I put all of these on an apples-to-apple -apple basis so I can figure out what is the most profitable, profitable bid for me today? But as a farmer, you have way, much, way too much uh, things going on, way too many things going on to be doing that every single day. You can't bring out Excel and punch all of these numbers into Excel every day to figure out, figure out this. And so what ends up happening is a lot of people default to just a handful of buyers, two to three buyers, maybe four buyers, the closest ones to their farm because generally they have the best prices. And it's true that a lot of uh, places close to your farm have, have the best price. We've done an analysis across the network, and this is what we found out. This graph shows the percentage of days that the best buyer is within a certain distance to your farm. So 54% of the time, the best buyer for you to consider even after factoring in transportation cost, is within 20 miles of your farm. This is generally the typical marketing radius that a farmer does from their farm. So half the time, the best price is within 20 miles. But that also means that half the time, the best price is beyond that. 30 miles, 50 miles, 80 miles, over 100 miles away, factoring in transportation costs. There's lots of opportunities that are getting overlooked because they're outside the traditional marketing radius. So... What Profit Center does is, on a daily basis, we're pulling in all this information. We're pulling in all of the bids across the country. Over 4,000 bids daily are coming into, into Profit Center. You can configure your own transportation costs and your own storage costs. All of that gets calculated to find out what is the best bid. If you put all of these on a level playing field, an apples-to-apples -apples comparison, which bid should you be considering? And you can filter it down if you want to sell grain today. What is the best bid? What is the best buyer for me? Where should I go if I want to sell my grain today? What's going to get me the best price? And you can compare what the prices are. Everything has been essentially factored into that net effective price for you. If you want to uh, sell grain in the future, do a forward contract. You can toggle over there and, and figure that out. If you want to haul your grain, then you can, you can uh, haul your grain yourself. Uh, or even call up a, 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 con, a, a custom hauler, and they'll haul it for you. If your transportation cost is already figured in there, then it doesn't really matter who's hauling your grain. You, put, you factored in transportation costs. So what you're looking for is the best deal. We've had growers that have realized an extra $0.80 cents per bushel by hauling 100 miles away, when they typically would only haul 30 miles away. Uh, that's, that's serious money. Um, Profit Center also enables you, if you want to keep track of all of your records, all your crop sales in there, we have a uh, target price to break even based on the amount of bushels that you have, the amount of bushels that you've sold, and at what price. And we'll continually calculate uh, how, much, how each bid is going to perform relative to your break even. Is it going to 
dig you out of the hole or uh, dig the hole deeper. Profit Center also enables you to uh, add alerts. So if you don't want to open it up every day and check the prices every day, if you just want to set a price and say, hey, FBN, let me know when the market gets to this price. Let me know when there's a price at this, at this point. Just enter that in there, and we'll send you a text message. You can do this for a ton of different crops. All of the commodity crops in there are in there. A ton of specialty crops are in there as well. You can set your alert price for uh, specialty crops. Let us know what price you want to sell your specialty crop for. We're constantly talking to buyers and getting quotes from buyers of products that they want to buy. You let us know what price you want to sell your crop at. When we find a buyer that wants to sell, wants to buy at that price, then we'll send you a text message. And you don't have to deal with calling around and trying to market your own crop. There's a lot more that's going to come in, uh, out in Profit Center this year. Uh, be on the lookout. Get enrolled today if you haven't. When you get home to your farm, get set up, start using it. There's going to be a lot more stuff that comes out, and it's going to be an extremely powerful marketing tool. Um, we've done a lot of work for things in season this year as well. Uh, so FBN has the, uh, uh, several different apps. We have the FBN Ops app, uh, the Prices app, the Seed Finder app. This year, we're actually going to be merging all of those into uh, one consolidated app. Um, the FBN Ops app, as I sh uh, said before, big uh, uh, emphasis this year on merging that data together with data from the website. Um, this year we're going to be also pulling in much more data from your account into the FBN Ops app. So all of your maps will be in there. So if you want to look at yield maps, you want to look at your soil maps in there, imagery maps. We did a, a, a beta of, of satellite imagery this year, sent them out in PDF reports, got a great uh, response in it. That's all going to be sent over to your phone for each of your fields. That's free of, free of charge for FBN members. Um, and 10 meter uh, resolution imagery. Uh, as soon as we get a new, uh, a new image from the satellite, which usually is flying around, I think it's uh, once every 10 days or so, it's going to be flying over, uh, over the US. So as long as we have a cloud free image, you show up on your phone. Uh, this year, we did a lot of work on being able to track more application data uh, in season during, in the field. So you can, within a couple clicks, you can uh, actually track a uh, chemical or fertilizer application on the phone. Um, you can create your tank mixes in the FBN uh, website so that they're all available on your phone uh, when you go out there. So you don't have to go through adding all of the products and all of the rates on the phone if you want to. But once you're in a field, you can just pull out the FBN Ops app. It'll recognize what field you're in. And you can say, hey, I'm doing an application and I've already created this mix for my plan, or I sprayed this product in the last field, and I just want to apply it to this field. That keeps you up to date, keeps other people in your operation up to date. That's also going to power all of those very valuable analytics I was talking about earlier um, around uh, chemical fertilizer benchmarking, uh, fertilizer analytics based on yield, fungicide applications, and everything like that. A lot of those analytics, just like every other part of FBN, are going to be contingent on contributing to the network. And so if you want to get access to chemical and fer fertility analytics, then you'll need to start adding data into the system. We're trying to make it as easy as possible. You can use the app. You can send in data from your monitor. Whatever way you can get it in, we want to make it as easy as possible to get that data into the network. Uh, this is another thing that's uh, under development, but we're pretty excited about. Um, we're not exactly sure how this is going to come out into the product, but this year we've also been working on uh, a beta program doing in-season yield forecasts. So utilizing weather and utilizing satellite imagery and looking at what varieties you've planted on the different fields and how we have observed how those varieties have performed in the past under different weather conditions, we're starting to track how we think that variety is going to perform throughout the year. So after planting, and after a month or so of weather, and after we get some satellite imagery to see how the field's looking, we can make a better guess at how that variety might perform than you might have guessed at the beginning of the year. And we'll continually track that throughout the year as weather changes, and continually send up, and we can continually send updates. And the forecast will get tighter and tighter as, year, as the time goes on, because the, the risk that weather is going to change goes down because there's less time. And there's lots of potential uses for this, uh, forecasting how varieties might perform. So when you're, uh, you're getting uh, called on by seed dealers in August and you have no idea how the varieties are going to perform, 
we might be able to do some forecasting about that. Crop marketing, getting a better idea of how much grain you might actually be able to sell. These are all potential use cases, something that we're, we're working on and something that will be uh, coming out in some form or another um, this year. Um, I'll mention weather. FBN has a pretty very powerful weather system, and uh, we're tracking weather on all fields um, uh, throughout the year, and, and uh, even when you put in data, historical data, we're pulling all the weather information for all those fields uh, back into time. That weather information is used throughout all of our analytics. Um, weather is a major uh, influence, uh, has a major influence on yield, so it needs to be considered. We also make it available to everyone in their, your accounts. So there's a weather tab in Analyze My Operation, and you can go see how much uh, moisture, how much uh, cumulative rainfall has, has occurred on your fields. You can look on a field level basis back in time and compare um, what was the average temperature on this field uh, last year during the month of June versus the five year average. What was the max wind speed during uh, July versus the five-year average? So if you have any questions around thinking, hey, yield is really high this year uh, or really low this year, and I think it was because of something that happened during pollination. Well, you can start looking at that and look at the different weather variables. There's probably eight or nine different weather variables from uh, temperature to precipitation to wind to soil moisture to evapotranspiration to solar, solar radiation. Uh, it's an extremely powerful tool um, that's pulling weather data in from all across uh, weather stations in the United States, pulling it in from uh, uh, satellite data and things of that nature. And we've tried to make it as accessible as possible, as well as uh, driving a lot of the analytics that we deliver. Uh, so finally, the reason that we can do all of this is by participation from all of you. It's your data that makes any of this possible. The only way that we can even start to dream up uh, any of these types of features is, well, number one, from the feedback that you give us, which is very valuable, but also from the data that you contribute. Uh, so if you haven't already contributed data, um, when you get back to your farm, send your data in, monitor data, uh, seed tag data, uh, invoice data. That's what you need to get the full value out of FBN, is sending that data in and uh, it just powers all of the really cool things that we can be working on. Uh, so for those of you that have already sent that in, thanks. Um, and if you haven't, I uh, appreciate uh, if you can send that in when you get back. Um, so that's it for uh, the product training. We'll be around if you have any questions. Um, I think we have a, uh, a crop circles um, session. Uh, Charles has a few last notes. Thank you, Danny. I'd just like